It's important to preserve old games. For a lot of people, it's a core part of their childhood and formative years. But it's not always easy resurrecting a 25-year-old game, especially when it was written for different hardware and operating systems. Someone on my Discord said that Discworld Noir doesn't work on modern Windows, and although there's a patch, it stretches the game and the cutscenes crash. Now this is a problem I'm interested in. I've never played the game, but I'm a big fan of Terry Pratchett, so let's see what we can do. I've grabbed the game from an abandonware site, slapped it into a VM, and installed it. The files, which are installed straight into the C-hole, have some suspicious entries, namely this ICD file. This indicates that the game is using the safe disk DRM, specifically version 1, a fine vintage. What looks like the game is actually a loader, which will verify that the disk is present and decrypt it. Now we also have this secdrive.sys file. This is a Windows driver the game will install, and is used to verify the disk. One of the novelties of this DRM is that it encodes data in such a way on the CD that most commercial software will fail to duplicate. So what this driver is doing is checking for the presence of those hard to copy sectors. The driver actually has a vulnerability in it and was discontinued by Windows. So even if we had a legit copy of the CD, we still wouldn't be able to play it. We've got our work cut out for us. Double clicking it obviously doesn't work. So let's attach a debugger. I'm using x64 debug to see what's going on under the hood. Ah, classic. The game doesn't want me to do exactly what I'm trying to do. Let's crack this open in Ghidra, an open source decompiler and disassembler, to peer into its guts. The string from the message box is here, but it's a Windows resource, so not referenced directly by any code. Instead, we can go back to the debugger and set a breakpoint on message box A, the Win32 function for showing a message box. And it's called from here, so we can go up the call stack to see where that is called from. This is possibly some string obfuscation and or localization code. However, if we keep digging, we get to this if statement, which controls whether the message box is shown or not. The function that calculates the checked result looks complicated, and I've no interest in figuring this out right now, so let's just change the value in the debugger and continue. Now if we continue stepping through the program, we quickly get to this miserable set of jumps. This keeps jumping, sometimes changing flags, and even sometimes in unaligned instructions. Eventually it executes a small bit of what looks like real code, and then continues on jumping. This is some sort of obfuscation technique. If we look at the function in Ghidra, it's a complete mess with no way of knowing what it's doing. It looks like it's taken the code, broken it up into blocks, maybe even line by line from the source code, and then inserted these jump chains. How would you implement this? It's almost certainly done via a tool, because no sane developer is sitting there handcrafting these artisanal jump instructions. The majority of these jumps are forward, so we just need to run through all these jumps until we hit a non-jump, and then patch out everything in between. I've written a small C++ app that uses libcapstone to try and disassemble the whole program. When it finds a jump, it takes the jump offset, moves to that, and then sees if that's a jump, repeating ad nauseum until it finds a non-jump. It basically simulates the code running. There's a few edge cases, like if a jump chain is started from a legit if statement and some negative jumps, but after it's run, it has an array of all possible jump chains. I took the somewhat arbitrary decision to take all the chains that were at least three jumps to try and remove false positives, and then just knocked out everything. And the results are pretty good. Before, after. Now it's not perfect, but it does make things a bit easier. So continuing through the code, we hit an int1 instruction. Again, before and after deobfuscation makes things a bit clearer. This is a special instruction that sends an interrupt to the kernel that the debugger has stopped on. I've stared at this for a while, and I think I figured out what's going on. At the start of the function, as a special instruction which is registering a handler for an SEH exception. This is a Windows-specific exception mechanism that works in both C and C++. Yes, you can have try and catch in C on Windows. Now int1 is interesting, as it is the interrupt a debugger will use when it wants to single step your application, which is why it's stopping on it. If you run this without a debugger, then the program catches it and executes its exception handler. However, if you run it within a debugger, then the debugger stops here and never executes the handler. So let's put a breakpoint on the handler and tell x64 debug to continue as if it didn't catch the interrupt. So we get here, and if we step through this, we end up here, setting a global value to some magical number. Now, taking a step back, if we look at the call site for this int1 function, then it resets this flag, calls the int1 function, and then checks for the magic number. It's quite cute, really, as the debugger's default mode will prevent the game from setting this value. However, it's quite easy to bypass, as we just have to nop out the int1 instruction and the check for the magic value. If we continue, we end up in nonsense, which, looking at the section for the code in the binary, is all nonsense. This means the game is actually obfuscated, and the game deobfuscates it at runtime. However, because it's failing to do so, I suspect there are silent anti-debug checks that we are falling foul to. This site has a great list of Win32 anti-debugging techniques, and we just need to grind through them. 
I found one here, which scans the game memory for the byte OXCC. This is a special one byte instruction debuggers insert when you set a breakpoint, so it's checking if you've tried to set any breakpoints. Here it's checking the PEB or process execution block, which is a special structure the Windows kernel creates for every process, and in that is a flag saying if it's being debugged. I've patched all these checks out, and the game still lands in nonsense code. Okay, so I've actually now reverted all those patches because I don't know if any of them have any adverse side effects, and we're just going to do one to start with, which is the int1 check. I've written a separate program which can patch the game whilst it's running, i.e. there's no debug ever attached. So let's try changing the reset value by a single byte as it should have no semantic impact to the game, yet it still crashes. I've put a hardware breakpoint on the code itself, so the game will stop if it tries to read it. And sure enough it stops here, reading chunks of its own code into a buffer. I've started reverse engineering this and I can see several functions for reading and writing using various different methods, but I've stopped here. I believe the game is using its own code as part of the deobfuscation key, which means any patches we make will render the game unplayable. Which is pretty clever. Ok, let's take a step back. We're not actually fixing any of the issues with it running on modern Windows, we're just fighting a DRM. I've ordered a copy of the game on eBay, but for now let's just see if we can get it running locally. As I said before, the game will never run on modern Windows because of the withdrawn driver, however it is possible to emulate it. In a previous video, I reverse engineered the driver and created a shim which will correctly respond to all the driver calls and responses. I'll leave a link to that below, but for now let's just take it and throw it into the game. Ok, it now runs to the splash screen with this error. We can see the calling point for the code is rubbish as it's in the obfuscated section, however the game has progressed enough to deobfuscate its code and kindly stopped for us on this message box. So we can use the debugger to dump the process and now we can see all the code in Ghidra. The message box is failing to read some file from win.ini, this is an old school key value store that apps could use on Windows before they added the registry. In fact, it's still hanging around on your Windows system now for backwards compatibility, so let's just add these missing values. Ok, so we get the splash screen and then the app exits. My gut feeling is that it's trying to decrypt the ICD file, but it hasn't got the key because we don't have a CD, and I can't attach a debugger because I've not yet finished patching out all the anti-debug techniques in a non-destructive way. Luckily for us, the CD should be arriving soon. This is very strange, there is no ICD file on this disc, and in fact, as far as I can tell, it just has the raw game on here with no DRM. This is great, but I can't work out why the rip from the abandonware site has the DRM. Maybe this is some sort of re-release. Ok, let's roll the dice on another copy from eBay. Has any time passed, or is this just YouTube editing magic? It's impossible to say. And this is the same. Fascinating. Ok, so for the rest of the video I'm going to use this version because it's easy to use, and the actual problem I want to solve is the compatibility one. As an aside, a rip of this CD does exist on the internet somewhere. You'll know you've got the right version if CD1 has a text file called discworldnoirlastupdate.txt, which clearly states it has compatibility issues with Windows 2000 and XP. Ok, let's run this. It starts off in full screen mode, which is a bit offensive on a modern system. Starting a new game, we get the initial cutscene, but after, if we try and exit out, then we crash. It also does the same if you just let the cutscene play through. This is in line with what I was told on Discord. I've looked around where it crashes, and the game has loads of useful strings in it. These assert messages give us a good idea of what the code is doing, and I'm surprised they've not been stripped out. There's also what looks a lot like a logging function, controlled by a global flag. If we set this after the game starts, then we get this log file. It has some really useful things in it, like read the dog is for the dog, and zzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzzz
I've been poking a bit more around the game and it reads a bunch of data from the registry, which I found here. One of these options is to toggle full screen, which sounds useful as it's a pain to debug when it's rendered across the whole screen. Let's just toggle that. Okay, so it runs in a more respectable subsection of the screen, but it does look like it's having a bad trip. What's interesting is that the cutscenes now pass, and as far as I can tell, the game plays normally, except for the squished purple hue aesthetic. I've had some bad days since I started work as a private investigator, but I'd never woken up dead before. It Wait, is that Rob Brydon? It is Rob Brydon. Anyway, let's see if we can fix this. The game uses direct draw, which is actually quite easy to hook. When it starts, the game will load a library called ddraw.dll. If we create a library with that name and put it in the same directory as the game, then when it launches, it will find and load that first. There's only two functions we need to recreate in our library, and the most important is direct draw create, which the game will call once to create a direct draw object, which it will then use for all further graphical calls. So in our DLL, we can still call the original function to return to the game a legit direct draw object, but it does offer us an opportunity to modify it first. What modifications might we want to make? Well, the API we're hooking returns a COM object, which is a Microsoft framework for creating binary software components. Basically, you get back a pointer, and that points to another pointer, which in turn then points to an array of function pointers. If you're familiar, this is very much like a C++ V table, and if you're not familiar, this is very much like a C++ V table. What this actually means is that we can access a bunch of function pointers which have a fixed known order. So if we want to say hook create surface, we have right to the seventh function in the array. So using this, we can selectively rebuild the com objects as the game creates them, which allows us to hook any function we want. And if we do some basic logging, we can see the game calling our code. So I've carefully poured over the traces between the full screen and the windowed version, and I've made an observation. In the game logs, we can see it outputs the pitch, which is the number of bytes in each row of the surface. We can see the game has a hard-coded width of 640 pixels. Using simple division, we can infer that when it's running in full screen mode, it's using 16 bits per pixel, but in Windows mode, it's using 32 bits per pixel. 16 bits per pixel was pretty common in older systems, as it used less memory typically 5 bits for red, 6 bits for green, and 5 bits for blue. However, modern systems tend to use 32 bits per pixel, so 8 bits per channel. Now, if a game requests to be full screen, it can choose whatever bit depth it wants because it has exclusive access to the entire screen. But if it's running in a windowed mode, then it has to respect the bit depth of the Windows desktop because the Windows Compositing system will not translate between different bit depths. So let's dig into this in the code. Looking at where the log statement is called from, we can see that it sets the pitch into a global variable, which interestingly defaults to ox500, or 16 bits per pixel for 640 pixels. So in theory, the game supports different pitches. However, the code that copies the data to the back surface has a hard-coded pitch of ox500, which is almost certainly a bug. I've modified my hooked code to make the game think it's rendering to 16 bits per pixel. Then just before it blitz it to the screen, I adjust the pixel values to the modern format. It doesn't really work, I get this weird ghosting effect, which suggests to me I'm copying the data incorrectly. I've spent some time trying to figure this out, and I just can't get it working. I suspect the game is making a lot of hard-coded assumptions about the underlying hardware, and it might be getting inputs to that from other functions that I'm just not hooking. Anyways, I've changed my approach. I now let the game render using the default values and its own assumptions, but I create a separate buffer for it to render to, instead of the one given to us by the Direct Draw API. Then again, before we blit it, I manually copy the bytes over to the real buffer and fix them up, expanding 16-bit colors to 32 bits. And it works! I've played it a bit and it all seems pucker. I've been... Mr. Luton? If I'm not, I should fire the guy who painted the door. I've put all the code for this on GitHub if you want to try it out, and feel free to join the Discord if you want to discuss it further. But there's a game from the late 90s that's also broken on modern versions of Windows, so check out this video if you want to see how I fix that.